Welcome everybody to this event. You know, it's very exciting for us because we're only just getting back into public meetings again, so it does seem um, rather strange, but we really appreciate how you have come out to attend this meeting. I'm welcoming you on behalf of ICAD UK, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions uh, UK, Jewish Network for Palestine, and members of the One Democratic State campaign. The title of this evening is One State in Palestine, Back to the PLO Solution. Our distinguished guests are going to present their views on One Democratic State, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. One country, one citizenship, one parliament, and one shared civil society in which cultural, ethnic, and religious identities of all the country's people groups find expression. What would such a state look like? And is it possible to actually decolonize Israel? Each of our speakers will address this topic, and then we're going to have a Q&A session. Now, I have to say that 90 minutes is far too short to really unpack this topic at any length, but we'll do our best to give you an overview of it, I said, answer some of your questions, and then look forward to more events happening in the future as we continue to um, address this possibility. I would like to call upon our first speaker, who is Jeff Helper. Jeff Helper is an American by birth who has lived in Jerusalem since moving there to do his doctorate. He's an Israeli anthropologist who has taught in universities in Israel, the States, and in Central America. He serves as the director of ICAD, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. He's based in Jerusalem, and he's a founding member of the One Democratic State campaign. He's the author in, of several books. I'll just point out a couple of them now. One is War Against the People, Israel, the Palestinians, and Global Pacification, um, which was shortlisted for the Palestine Book Award. His latest book is Decolonizing Israel, Liberating Palestine, Settler Colonialism, Zionism, and the Case for One Democratic State. Jeff participated in the first and successful attempt of the Free Gaza Movement to break the Israeli siege into Gaza. And he was nominated by the American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers, um, for the Nobel Peace Prize, along with Palestinian intellectual and activist Ghassan Andoni. So with no further ado, Jeff, please come and speak to us. Thank you, Jeff Halper. Well, thank you for that introduction. Thank you all for coming. And thank you to Rada and to Chaim for agreeing to participate as well. I think all of us have been involved with the whole issue of a one-state approach to resolving you know, what's happening in, in historic Palestine. I mean, I'm actually a, a newer converter to that, a newer convert to that, uh, to that, having had other analyses over the years. I mean, my analyses have changed as as my knowledge has grown and the situation has changed as well. But it, it all derives from the fact, you know, ICAD, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, has always been a political organization. We're now marking our 25th year as an organization, unfortunately. I wish we could declare tonight that there's no longer need for an Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. Um, but we've always been political. And the focus has always been, for us, on how to resolve this whole issue. In other words, we, we are activists, we do resist, uh, we do write, we do organize campaigns, we do rebuild homes, we do a lot of the things. And, and, and you all do a lot of things, from BDS to, uh, to organized campaigning, to organizational work, to lobbying, and all that is really important. But you can't be in a political struggle without a political program without an end game. I mean, what are you BDSing for? Everything we're doing, we're doing towards what end? And there's a danger, actually, if everything is frozen and there's no political program, that much of what we're doing actually contributes 
to the to the illusion that somehow we're resisting and somehow things are being done, even though in fact nothing is moving whatsoever. And uh, and that can be a dangerous illusion. Gives us a feeling that we're getting somewhere where in fact we're really <coughs> stuck. So and, and you, as you know, there really hasn't been a political program for 30 years or so. Um, as Linda uh, indicated in her introduction, uh, you know, the Palestinians got it in the very beginning. From the beginning of the 20th century, from the very start of Zionism, uh, the Palestinians understood that they were being invaded by a colonial, uh, by a colonial force that Zionism was a settler colonial movement. They might not have had that terminology, which is kind of new in the academic world, but they knew it and they wrote about it in their newspapers and, and, and they organized against it. it. Even in the early 1900s, uh, almost as soon as the Zionists began to appear, it became clear what they were after and they made clear exactly what they were after. They were after uh, taking over the country and Judaizing it. That anti-colonial resistance lasted all the way through the mandate period. Uh, <clears throat> of course, with a certain hiatus, I guess, not in terms of the concept that the Palestinians are an anti-colonial struggle, but from the, the ability to, to, to actually um, organize and work from, let's say, 1948 uh, until the Palestinian, the PLO was established um, uh, in the middle of the 1960s. So there was a hiatus. But when the PLO was, especially after the, the 1967 war, when, when Arafat and the Palestinians really took over the PLO, from the very beginning, they returned to the idea that this is an anti-colonial struggle. The PLO's position was always that we're fighting for liberation, we're in an anti-colonial struggle against Zionism. It was only, of course, as we know, uh, into the 1970s and culminating in 1988, that the Palestinians, uh, well, I, I'm not going to get into why I was in, in that room, but where the PLO began to shift from a liberation struggle, an anti-colonial uh, organization, into one that accepted the idea that they're in a conflict with, uh, with Israel. And that led them, of course, in 1988 to formally adopt the two-state solution, as a political program that then, led, that then led into Oslo, which from my point of view at least, was a, was a fatal mistake. And I think Palestinians are aware of that. And we're all paying the price for that today. But since, uh, I'm gonna argue in a second that the two-state solution isn't dead. The two-state solution was never alive. It was never a concept, it was never an intent. Uh, but certainly, uh, even if people do still think in terms of, of conflict and two sides and, and a two-state solution, certainly since um, the end of the Oslo peace process in 2000, roughly, in other words, more than 20 years ago, certainly we all understand, and I, I think the Palestinians understand, that the two-state solution is never was and it's gone and it's not a political program. But there is no alternative political program that's emerged over the years. For the last 20 years has been a vacuum. And again, all the resistance and protest and campaigning um, and resistance of Palestinians on the ground and, and work we do as Israelis that are trying to fight uh, Israeli colonization and, and occupation is all important. But if you don't have an end game, if you don't have a political program, you, you're not a political actor. You're not a political actor. And so uh, about uh, five years ago in 2017, a number, uh, a number of us, um, um, a, number of a good number of Palestinian activists, intellectuals, academics, political <laughs> figures, uh, the head of the One Democratic State campaign is Awad Abdel Fattah, who was one of the founders with Azmi Bishara of the Balad party or the Tijamo party. Uh, in Israel, the, the Palestinian Nationalist Party, and was for many years the Secretary General. And there are some very prominent Palestinians involved, both within 48, in the occupied territories, and also in the diaspora. Uh, but we came together, uh, Palestinians and anti-colonial, or I could even say anti-Zionist 
Israelis like myself, we came together, and over a couple of years, we managed to formulate um, a 10-point political program. Uh, in other words, the idea of one state, of course, has floated around for a long time. And there's been conferences, and there's been declarations, um, uh, and, and Rada and Chaim are involved with another one democratic state group that we're in contact with. They'll talk about that as well. Uh, and our, our, I think our, our collective attempts have been to really uh, make this concept of one state concrete, give it, give it detail, give it substance, so it really becomes a political program. What the, what the one democratic state group did, the ODS group did, for example, is they drafted a constitution for that state. Uh, what we've done is we've tried to think through the entire process of how do you, how do you decolonize Zionism and the, and the colonial state of Israel, and then what do you replace it with? I mean, decolonization, liberation are one stage, but then what do you replace it with? And to try to visualize, and that's the thing I want to talk about briefly tonight, what one democratic state would look like, how it would work, and why it would be uh, just and doable. So I want to suggest two things tonight, really quickly. Um, one is that in order to go anywhere, to go forward politically, whether in understanding what this issue is about or in formulating a political program that's, that's meaningful, we have to undergo, undergo a paradigm shift. And it's not just semantics. We talk about this as a conflict. You know, we all talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict. We talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, governments talk about it. The media talks about it. Uh, uh, even Palestinians refer to it as a, as a conflict. And there isn't another term. That's, uh, that's, that's usually used. I mean, it's known as the conflict. And that's been the conception that has guided, if you want to put it that way, the political um, uh, process, you know, over the last, you know, certainly ever since uh, 1967, if not before. But it's not a conflict. <laughs> and it's a very important distinction. A conflict takes place between two or more sides. Okay, the minute you say sides and Israel is one of those sides, you're legitimizing Israel as a side. From our point of view, you're legitimizing a settler colonial movement as a legitimate side in a conflict. So right there, you begin to get the language we know so, so well, both sides. Both sides should end the conflict, both sides should end the violence, both sides should negotiate, right? And it becomes a false symmetry between between uh, and, and a unilateral invasion of a colonial of a colonial uh, people into uh, a foreign country and the resistance of the indigenous population to that invasion. So conflict creates that false symmetry that certainly benefits and legitimizes the colonial side. It, it actually decolonizes in some ways the colonial side because it becomes simply a side. Uh, of course, a conflict has to do with a dispute. You're in conflict over something. So there's a, there's a dispute. But in, in this situation, there is no dispute. Well, what's the dispute? <laughs> you know, Palestinians never got into a dispute with, with the Zionists. Uh, they were living in their country. And uh, towards the, the turn of the 20th century, were invaded by, uh, by the Zionist movement, uh, you know, which is super well documented. And so, and so there's, no, there's no dispute here. There's resistance. And of course, if there's a dispute, how do you resolve disputes? How do you resolve a conflict? Conflict resolution. What does that mean? It means both sides sit down, they negotiate, right? They compromise, and they come up with some kind of a deal of the century, right? Well, if you're a colonized people, what are you going to negotiate? What are you negotiating? You're your national existence, your physical existence, your, your heritage, uh, your, your, your ties to your own country, uh, you know, the fact that you're being dispossessed. I mean, what is there exactly to negotiate in this kind of a situation? And what is there to compromise on? So the whole idea of, of a conflict 
locks us into a way of thinking, a way of approaching, and I'll get to that in one second, that, that completely misanalyzes the situation and, and is a trap for us. Um, that we have, to, and so we need an alternative term. There isn't a, a, a real uh, convenient, short, uh, readily understandable alternative term. Everybody gets what a, a, a conflict is. Everybody gets what occupation is. Everybody gets what apartheid is. Settler colonialism? Whoa, that sounds like it belongs in SOAS somewhere, in some lecture hall, in some, in some textbook. I mean, it's way too complex and, and not a and vague concept, but that's, that's the name, and we have to see how we can approve on that. But what I'm trying to suggest is the paradigm shift we have to go through, which means a whole new language, and it leads us in a completely different direction politically. It, it has an alternative logic. These aren't just two uh, alternatives. They have absolutely alternative <coughs> logics to them. We have to stop using the word conflict, the concept conflict, and we have to consider, consider this, the Palestinian struggle, as an anti-colonial struggle against Zionist settler colonialism. I mean, that, I think, names, names the issue. And it's a struggle of the Palestinian people together with anti-Zionist or anti-colonial Israelis against, uh, against Zionist settler colonialism. So... And, and again, this isn't just semantics, because it locks us into different, uh, you know, if you're, in, in, if you're a, a doctor and you're, uh, you're diagnosing some disease, you know, the treatment that you give flows from your diagnosis. Well, if you're, if you're misdiagnosing, if you're using a wrong term and a wrong set of principles and a wrong understanding, you're going to get to a wrong a political conclusion. In other words, you don't get to one democratic state through the idea of conflict. It doesn't lead to that. That's not a compromise. And at the same time, uh, you don't get to a, 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 you know, a two-state solution if you conceive of this as a settled colonial um, uh, issue and not, and not a conflict. So in other words, if it's a conflict, the two-state solution is very understandable mm -hmm. because that's the compromise. You have you have both sides, right? They're they're compromising, and uh, and the result, just or not, it doesn't matter. You know, conflict resolution is whatever you can get both sides to sign on. So it usually has nothing to do with justice or anything like that. You get to a two state solution that doesn't work, and we know it. And and in fact, it hasn't worked. And in fact. Uh, uh, it, it, it never was because Zionist settler colonialism always, from the very beginning, aspired to Judaize, which is the word they use and still use, to Judaize Palestine. The whole purpose of Zionism until today was to transform an Arab country into a Jewish country, transform Palestine into the land of Israel. Well, if you, if you get that, that that's the settled colonial agenda, that's not going to lead you to a two-state solution. And in fact, because, because uh, we, we understand that, I think, today much more, uh, uh, we can say that the two-state solution isn't only gone, but it never was at all. We've wasted all these years <laughs> trying to negotiate something that was unjust and undoable and completely uh, not in the cards. On the other hand, if you approach this as a, from a set of colonial point of view, you get to a whole different place politically. Apartheid, that now, you know, at least Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, Petzello, the UN, you know, many other human rights organizations have really documented uh, exhaustively why this is an apartheid system. You wouldn't get to apartheid from a, from a conflict point of view. But apartheid is the, nor is the natural outcome of a settler colonial movement. Because if, in fact, the, the, the settlers want to take over the whole country, if you want to Judaize Palestine and take the land and make it into a Jewish 
state in a Jewish country and displace and dispossess the Palestinians, okay? But like in South Africa, you're not able to dislodge all the Palestinians. We managed to expel half of them, but you know, there's still uh, 6 million Palestinians that remain. Well, how do you make the country Jewish and half the population or more is, is Palestinian? So the only way out of that dilemma is apartheid, where Israel today uh, rules over 85% of the country and the Palestinians, uh, four-fifths of whom have no citizenship, are locked into 15% of the country, which is a very similar proportion to South Africa. Well, that is Israel's solution. Israel believes that it can support apartheid in the way that South, it can sustain apartheid in the way that South Africa couldn't. And in fact, the international support that Israel gets, including, of course, from your governments, um, okay, um, you know, uh, give Israel reason to believe that that's the case. But the other, so the only other alternative, it's almost mathematical, you know, if it's not a conflict, it's not a, it's not a two-state solution, Apartheid is not is, is possible, it's done, actually, but it's not acceptable. And so the only alternative becomes one democratic state. In other words, one democratic state uh, uh, does two things in particular. One, it decolonizes. In other words, the, the only way you end a colonial situation is to decolonize it. You don't end the colonial situation through negotiations. You have to decolonize the colonials, otherwise you're leaving you're leaving the power structures and the power differentials in place, even though it appears that maybe you've negotiated something like a two-state solution. And in fact, and I won't get into this, it's in, it's in uh, my book, um, Israel has imposed what I call a dominance and maintenance regime. In other words, there's a real strategy, and, I, and our group has tried to, to deal with that, of how do you exactly decolonize? What does it mean to decolonize Zionism? Which I'm not going to get into now. Um, a second part of the liberation process for Palestinians is, is that the Palestinians have to sit down among themselves and say, what does liberation mean to us? What, what are the minimal requirements? What, what, what do we need to bring our people together, to bring our people back home, to heal our people, to unite our people, uh, to give our people a future, to, to, to really uh, have a national life that's meaningful and substantial. What does that mean for us? And to come to that without dealing with Israelis, without dealing with, that's an intra-Palestinian discussion. That's, and the third part of the liberation process is then the Palestinians have to take their concept of liberation, and now you've got the problem, all right, how do you reconcile that with the fact that, that after decolonization, half the population of, of your country is still going to be Israeli Jews. It's not going to be Israel, but Israeli Jews are not leaving. I mean, they're a fact of life. So how then do we reconcile uh, those two things? And uh, uh, I just have a minute left, but let me just say there's four, uh, really quick, there's four, I mean, it's a 10-point program, but there's four main aspects to our, to our program. First one is, one democratic state means that one state equals citizenship for all its inhabitants. In other words, one person, one vote, one government, one parliament, one legal system, one constitution, with no ifs, ands, or buts, no confederation, no federation, no binational state, an absolute straightforward democracy. And that by itself begins to dismantle a lot of the colonial system. Because as we know, the colonial system of Israel is based on the hierarchy. Who you are in terms of your national and, and religious identity determines where you are in society and, what, and what's open to you in society. Equal citizenship breaks that down. Secondly, the, right of ret the, the return of the refugees. Of course, I mean, that has to be uh, you know, a, a priority. The refugees. Now, what's interesting, we get into the logic of a civil state one democratic state, the refugees have a double right to return. Um, and that is they have a right to return in international law. But they're also the citizens of that country. Just because in 1948, 
you fled your home during a war or you were driven out of your home doesn't mean you lost your civil status. This whole concept of ours of refugees of being as being rightless, stateless people is simply not true, especially in, 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 in a democratic state concept. They have never lost their citizenship. And so they simply come back. In other words, they have the right to return, but they also come home automatically as citizens. I won't, and there's more to say that I won't. The third aspect is, uh, is what I talked about before, which is really crucial. And I don't know how to say it in a sentence, but I'll try. And that is that, you know, <clears throat> you have one state of, of equal citizenship, but we all know that Palestine is not Nebraska. And uh, it's not just a bunch of uh, individual citizens running around. There are national groups. And I think we all have to accept the fact that there are two national groups. I mean, there are two national groups in Palestine. There's Palestinian Arabs and there are Israeli Jews. And the problem with national groups, and then there's Hamas and there's, there's religious, uh, I mean, there's a third aspect, you know, which is more of a religious nationalism than a, than kind of a, 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 a nationalist nationalism. Um, and, and the problem, of course, with national groups and religious groups is that they, they want to be hegemonous. They want to take over. That's, if you think of what does Palestinian liberation mean, it means us Palestinians come back and take our country back. We, we liberate it. We liberate ourselves. And we, so that, so that the, the, the assumption is that this will become a Palestinian state again. But then you hit up again against the problem of, well, what, what happens to the Israelis? And, and, and it goes the other way as well, because, of course, Israelis don't recognize Palestinian Arabs. As, so that what's happened in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the global south is that after the colonial powers have been defeated and independence and liberation have been, have been achieved, the vast majority of post-colonial states fall back into the civil war. And what's, what is crucial then in this, and this is what I just want to say, what's crucial here. Is that there's a is that there's a civil state that we have to create a neutral civil state. We don't have a name for it. Let's call it Zakarville, the state of Zakar, whatever, in which you have a shared civil identity. You have like a third uh, realm of sovereignty, and that civil state is sovereign, and it's sovereign over the national groups. So you you create space for the national groups. You can't ignore them. They're there and they're powerful and you, they need their space and people need the space. You know, refugees coming back are coming back as Palestinians. The importance here is not only to, 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 to uh, provide a third space, but it has to be a space, a civil space strong enough that it can contain and control the impulses of national and religious groups to want to take control. You see, the only way it's going to work is if you have a civil state that keeps everything in control and that's shared by everyone. And then the fourth element is that if you have a strong civil society uh, emerging, that then gives rise, can give rise to a new uh, civil identity, to a new civil society, a new political community, especially I think of young, in the beginning, young people, middle-class people, more secular people, We'll, we'll understand that, and over time, this civil society will grow and strengthen so that you really create a third shared space for uh, Israelis and Palestinians. I, I ran over time, and I'm, and I'm sorry. It's, 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 it's a lot to present, but, but at any rate, this is the, I think, you, you're getting the idea. This is a framework of a genuine political program that I think is just and doable and comes out of the whole idea that you have to decolonize Zionism. How it can be done is something we can talk about maybe in the questions and answers. Good taste trick for us right now. Our next speaker is Haim Rashif. Professor Haim Rashif grew up in Israel. He's a filmmaker, photographer, and film studies scholar. He worked at the University of East London, where he gained his professorship. And he was a professorial research associate here at SOAS. He has worked as the editor of The Gulf War and the New World Order with Mira Yuval Davis. 
and he's the author of Holocaust for Beginners with Stuart Hood. His films include The Widely Shown State of Danger, a documentary on the first Palestinian Intifada, and London is Burning after the 2011 riots. He has also written in the Israeli Haaretz and the Cairo based Al Faran Weekly. Haim Rashid is also a member of the Jewish Network for Palestine, Bricka, British Committee for the Universities of Palestine, the One Democratic State Campaign, and the Convencia Alliance, including Jews, Muslims, and Christian groups. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you for coming today, and thank you, Linda, for inviting me to join my two good friends. Uh, we have spoken many times together before, and I hope we shall do so again. Last night, Jeff and myself had an unpleasant experience. Linda has organized, as head of iCard UK, a meeting because of Jeff's coming to London. We wanted to use this opportunity to speak to Jewish groups who support Palestine about the One Democratic State. And I can just say we were not welcome. I'm using a very uh, neutered term. Basically, people said to us, why are you telling us this? We don't need to know about it. It's not interesting, it's nothing to do with us. And we have more important things to do, like to do solidarity with Palestine. So I want to answer that question just in case it might come later on. Uh, why did we speak to Jewish solidarity organizations in London? Because I am now standing and you are sitting a few miles away from where the Balfour Declaration was signed. Actually, saw us played a minor role in that, and I've written about it uh, in the SOAS magazine. So, because SOAS was created the year before as um, the uh, farm for training colonial administrators. And they advised on the Balfour Declaration, and another man who advised about the Balfour Declaration, not surprisingly, was the first and um, legendary editor of The Guardian. So this is why we're speaking about it to people in London, because London has created the Palestine problem. If not for the Balfour Declaration and everything that followed, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about Palestine because the Palestinians would still be there. So that's the first thing I wanted to remind people, that we, the British, have a duty which nobody else has because we have created this problem, the Irish problem, the India um, Pakistan problem, the Cyprus problem, and I won't go on. Uh, so uh, it's about time that the British stopped uh, pretending that they are an empire and start mending the crimes of their empire for 200 or 400 years, if you think about Ireland. Now, I want to ask a few questions because I want to stick to time. Peter Bynard published yesterday a very interesting article in which he starts discussing uh, the Palestine problem uh, by answering, um, not very well, I must say, I, I, I really appreciate Peter Bynard's um, work, but I don't think his answer is very good to the question, does Israel have a right to exist? And he twists and turns, because you can't say, like Jeff has just told us, Israel does not have a right to exist because it's a settler colonial project, for fuck's sake. You know, you have to remember what it is. Israel has no more right to exist than the Raj of India under the British, yeah? Or the control of Cyprus uh, under the British. Now, of course, there are great differences. Um, I, I won't go into them now, but... Um, that's one of the questions that people are asking you. Are you actually saying that Israel has no right to exist? Yes, we're saying Israel, as it is set up, has no right to exist, never had a right to exist. We're not saying that Jews can't live in Palestine, and the Palestinians are not saying that, which is more important than what we are saying. So, um, if Israel is a militarized colonial project, which makes the life of every Palestinian hell before they are shot and killed in the street or in the home or in the um, in the bed. Um, why would we have an argument about its right to exist? The second thing to, to do is to say no Jew has come up with a plan as progressive as the PLO plan of 1964 of one democratic state in Palestine. 
Um, different groups, and I don't have time to talk about it, and the leading one is Brit Shalom, uh, in the 30s, until 1933, have um, done a lot of work uh, about the binational state. But I think, uh, having listened to, to Jeff, you know that we're not talking about a binational state, because a binational state means a Zionist state in part, and a Zionist state cannot be part, and Zionism and colonialism cannot be part of the solution. It is the problem, after all, so it cannot be part of the solution. So um, different is um, Jewish and then Israeli intellectuals went as far as a bi-national state because they were unable or unwilling or both to give up on this idea of uh, a nationalism of colonialists that will continue. It's, imagine South Africa uh, that has a party, the colonial party, okay? And they want to chuck um, the blacks back to where they were during apartheid. This is the kind of binational state we're talking about. Yeah? This is the argument of Zionism. Palestinians shouldn't be there. Now, what we are talking about, and let's be brutally clear about this, because a lot of Jews uh, in Britain especially, I think uh, this is not the case in the United States. People are much more intelligent about this now, especially young people, naturally, they are more intelligent than us. And they know that we're talking about a decolonized space. And that's what we need to start doing. And if we are not talking about decolonizations, I don't have to talk to people that don't talk about that. Because as uh, you just heard, there is nothing to dispute and to discuss. The only subject that Israeli Jews need to uh, now think about is how to decolonize the system that they have built over almost 80 years that have um, caused untold suffering to the Palestinians. And we have no right, neither Jeff, nor myself, nor many of you uh, who may be Jewish or Israeli, we have no right to live in Palestine unless the Palestinians agree to this. If you don't accept that, you are supporting colonialism. And I'm sure there are not many supporters of colonialism here. The last thing I want to start on is the meme of the two-state solution, the narrative of the two-state solution, is what is on the lips of every idiot in parliament. Every time that you talk about Palestine, you hear, I support a two-state solution. Most of the friends of Israel in parliament are also friends of Palestine. Of course, if you are believing, I think Jeff is shown this very clearly. If you are believing there is a conflict, then be friends of both sides of the conflict and you will be able to work things out. How can you be a member of Friends of Israel, an organization that plans and executes um, the um, removal of ministers from the British government, successfully may I say, uh, and also be a member of Friends for Palestine that uh, are actually suffering um, because of the British mandate and everything that followed. Most of the members of the House do not recognize the responsibility of Britain for what we're facing. So first of all, I think we need to kill that meme. We need to kill that, sh uh, that idiotic meme of uh, I support the two-state solution. Now, how do you do it? If you don't suggest a solution which is realistic, which is just, which is doable, which is practical, which people can understand because they read about Ireland and they read about South Africa and they know that these things are possible and they also know that Jews and Muslims lived for over a thousand years in great friendship and, and convivencia. And anti-Semitism was never a problem in the Arab uh, world, apart from you know, two cases that everyone knows about in 1942 in Iraq. This is nonsensical. Anti-Semitism is a Christian European invention in the same way that slavery was a Christian European invention. In the same way that capitalism is a Christian European invention. So that there was not in history a problem for Jews to live in Al-Andalus. 
There was not a problem for them to live in the Ottoman Empire. There was not a problem for them to live in the Safavid Empire. There was not a problem for them to live in the Mughal Empire because they were controlled by non-Christians, in other words, by Muslims. And th those Muslims in invited the Jews of Al-Andalus in 1492 to come to Istanbul and live there and thrive there and be at the top ranks of the, um, um, as they were in Al-Andalus during um, the convivencia period. So, there is only one state between the river and the sea. Now, and for many years uh, before, since 1967, there is only one state between the river and the sea, but that is a sick and sickening apartheid state. And every day, this label is more justified than the day before. And every day, the life of Palestinians are more fraught and dangerous and miserable than before. So if there is one state, what do we want? What are we telling our politicians we want? Remember that without, uh, you know, uh, the average, uh, sorry, the, the combined age of the panel is 200 years or something. Right? <laughs> uh, I am looking forward to um, a panel that doesn't that actually come over 100. Pretty soon we will have young people talking about it. This is why we're talking about it, to bring young people to the topic. But those of us that remember um, what has happened uh, in those um, 80 years of Zionism, because we lived through it, um, know that um, there has never been anything but this state of apartheid, even before 1967, between the river and the sea. So uh, South Africa will never have been resolved unless millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, went to the government and said, one man, one vote, or, that's what they said, they meant one person, one vote, yeah? But you know what it is. So uh, they wanted a democracy that included everyone. And they got a kind of democracy. And our groups, our different groups in their deliberations about, and that's why we wrote the Constitution for Palestine as a united country, um, we wanted to discuss those details uh, so that we don't add with a, a second-rate second solution uh, read Naomi Klein about, you know, uh, she is amazing, describing the machinations of the Americans uh, in South Africa in the early 90s. So we don't want that. We want exactly what Jeff has described, one secular democratic state in which everyone can live in equality, in which the refugees are welcome and helped, in which the decades of um, terrible suffering of the Palestinians are addressed in many ways, not just a truce and reconciliation commission, which is a symbolic act, but in all the um, aspects that need to be addressed. <coughs> and to end, people say to you, you are idealist, you are uh, impractical, uh, this can never happen. Well, it happens. It happens if people push hard. It happened in South Africa. It happened in Northern Ireland. No one is killed every day or every week in Northern Ireland like they used to. It's not ideal, we know, that, but there isn't even a government there yet because of the Tories and, and the Unionists. But we don't have the conflict in Northern Ireland. Uh, it was being decolonized to a degree. So anyone that tells you that this is not possible is trying to make it impossible. Now, what is possible, according to the Zionists? Apartheid, we heard. That is possible, it's working for them, and uh, they want to continue it. If you disagree with that, what is possible? And we're saying to you, this is possible with your support, with everyone's support, like happened in the case of South Africa. So, unless we have something to put before our lawmakers, our politicians, our diplomats, the UN, uh, the different bodies, we are not in the game. We are just doing, okay, um, yeah, you suffer, and uh, we will build uh, classes, we will build water uh, develop developments in, in the West Bank or in Gaza, we will build rooms in universities. So the Israelis will bomb them, they will steal them, they will continue to uproot uh, everything that Europe and uh, the United States are paying for. And Europe and the United States, when they build a classroom, when they built a farm, 
uh, with uh, you know uh, environmental provision know that it might take a year or not even that and this will be gone so we don't want that we don't want to ease the suffering of the Palestinians we don't want merely to be solely there with them we do need that I said not merely we want political action to support us in Israel Palestine coming together and the last question is what shall we call it I don't know but I thought last night um, that we'll call it pi <laughs> pi and we can then you say you, you can call it pi in the sky you know <laughs> thank you very much Garakami was born in Jerusalem, but was forced to leave with her family as a result of Israel's creation in 1948. The family then moved on to England in 1949, where she grew up and was educated. She practiced as a doctor for many years, working as a specialist in the health of migrants and refugees. She held a number of research appointments on Middle Eastern politics and culture here at SOAS and in universities in Durham and Leeds. From 1999 to 2001, Gada Kami was an associate fellow of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, where she led a major project on Israel-Palestinian reconciliation. In 2009, she became a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Currently, Gada Kami is a research fellow at the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies, University of Exeter. And she's the author of several books, including In Search of Fatima, An Account of Her Childhood in Palestine and Coming of Age in London, Married to Another Man, Her Call for Palestinians and Israelis to Live Together in One Democratic State, and her latest, Return, a Palestinian memoir. Garakami, please come to the microphone. You got the you take Okay. Good evening, everyone. It's very nice to see you all. The One Democratic State is a wonderful vision because not only was it the idea, visionary idea of the PLO by a people who have already been traduced, expelled and tormented by uh, the colonial settlers, for them to come forward themselves and offer this wonderful hand to the usurpers who had done them so much harm and to say, look, let's sort this out, let's try and live together uh, in a, what was called a democratic, a non-sectarian state. Um, that was really visionary. I talked about it, I've believed in it, uh, the one democratic state for as long as I can remember. Um, but now, having said that, there is a reality I cannot ignore. If you ask uh, Israeli Jews, a, a majority of Israeli Jews, do they think it solves the issue, solves the problem, the one democratic state shared with Palestinians? They will say, certainly not. A majority will say, uh, we don't want to live with these people because you know, as well as I do, that uh, a majority of Jewish Israelis regard the Arabs, as they call them, as, uh, in, in, in a racist way, um, they consider them, in some cases, subhuman. Certainly the people in Gaza are, are subhuman. Uh, they are terrorists and people to be scared of. And this is a reality. Now, do you, if you ask people who believe this and think this, how do you feel about living with these people in one equal society? Um, they will say, no, thank you. No, thank you. Well, then what do you want to see, you ask them? They say, somehow, magically, we want them to disappear. We don't want Arabs here. We don't want them around. And in fact, what's happened is the next best thing, which is that the Israeli state has tried to minimize the Palestinian presence, not only through a continuing ethnic cleansing program, but through um, dismissing, belittling, uh, dehumanizing Palestinians in such a way that you can ignore them. And you know very well that, physically speaking, 
uh, Palestinian communities under Israeli rule are separated physically from Jewish Israelis. That's certainly true of the West Bank, it's true in Gaza, uh, with the very serious consequences of what that does. Add to it a factor which is extremely important, which we cannot afford to ignore, which is the complicity of Western states, the power given to Israel by Western states, the power given to it and the approval given to, given to it as it is, not as, well, you could be a democracy, why don't you, as it is, apartheid, brutal, oppressive, as it is, it enjoys Western support. This is very important. Now, if we look at the Palestinian Arabs and you ask them what they think about Jewish Israelis, a lot of them, most of them, nearly all of them will tell you, these people are usurpers, they are aggressors, uh, and they are aliens. They are alien settlers who've come from other lands, other countries whose cultures we don't understand, and it's nothing to do with us. That attitude has been enhanced by the physical separation I just mentioned. So, uh, I can tell you many, many people in, in, in towns and cities in the West Bank have never seen Israelis except as soldiers. And this is very important. And in Gaza, because of the siege, increasingly Palestinians in Gaza don't meet Israelis. They don't see them except when bombs are being thrown on them from the skies. For them, uh, the idea of a Palestinian state, now my colleagues talked about the two-state solution, but you know the component of the two-state solution, which has been very attractive for Palestinians, is the idea of an independent Palestinian state. The fact that it is in a tiny corner of Palestine, as projected by the two-state solution, is something they'll even put up with in return for a sense of independence not to be with Israeli, Israeli military breathing down their necks and to have their own flag, to have the freedom not to mix with these soldiers. Many Palestinians fear that in a, what we're talking about as a democratic shared state, they fear, they genuinely fear that the more, more advanced Jewish citizens of that state will make them into second class citizens. They can't keep up. Add to that, that it's the end of resistance for a lot of Palestinians. The Palestinians have resisted so bravely. So many of them have died. What about these martyrs? Do you just say, never mind about that, let's all go and live with these people who are killed? And look at Hamas. Hamas exists, and Islamic Jihad exists. They have a particular vision, and they certainly, if you said to them, well, how about forgetting about that vision, and let's all come and live together, they won't do it. Because remember, I've just said, if you asked the majority of Jewish Israelis, what would you like to see, they'd say to you, for the Arabs to disappear. Now, if you ask the majority of Palestinian Arabs, what would you like to see, they will tell you, we'd like the clock back, put back to before 1948, when these people were never here, and we, this country was ours, and it was Palestine, and there was no doubt about it. Given that level of rejection by both sides, which is real, if you had time, and education and people were getting used to the idea, you could, in theory, arrive at a point where a majority of people will be persuaded that actually sharing the land in, an, in a democracy is the only realistic way out of this. You could imagine that happening. But I think it would take a very, very long time. And I'm not in any way belittling the efforts of the One Democratic State campaign. There is a way that you can crack this. There is only one ruling sovereign state between the river and the sea. This is clear. This is a fact. The people of that state are ruled by the State of Israel. So, there is, there are no partitions, there are no two states, there's none of that.
there is one state and it's ruled by Israel. The population of that state is roughly equal, half and half, roughly, between Jewish Israelis uh, and Palestinian Arabs. Now, the apartheid that Israel practices, which is the way it's trying to deal with this, itself is insupportable. It cannot continue. People eventually react against apartheid, as we know very well from South Africa. So the Palestinian position would be to say to the state of Israel and to the world, we are being governed by the state of Israel. Half of us have rights and citizenship. Half of us have no rights and no citizenship. We can't have that. Either Israel leaves our territories, or if it wants to stay and we can't do anything about that, we're not strong enough. We demand equal rights. With all the people that Israel currently rules, we demand equal rights. Now, I want to put it to you that if this is done properly, by that I mean it's done as a collective aim, not just inside uh, Palestine, Israel, but outside as well, in the diaspora, people like me and some other people here in this audience, we all support and we all go for an equal rights campaign to end this. Now, such a campaign does not talk about violence. It does not in any way espouse killing Israelis, uh, expelling Israelis. It's talking about Palestinians and saying we need to have equal rights. But also, it would have to be accompanied by a very smart PR campaign aiming at the peoples in the Western world, the peoples of the Western world. They will understand it and they will empathize with it. And that is the way to win, uh, to win them over. This is a way forward out of this horrible uh, morass. Uh, and it also takes into account, which is how I started, that we have a real situation on the ground, which much as we would like to, we can't ignore. So when we have our ideals and we talk about um, the, the one democratic state that Jeff has talked about so well, that will be the end point. But the way to get there will be through a demand for equal rights, very much modeled on, on South Africa, very much modeled, although I know there are many differences between the two of them. What about if that doesn't happen? And that's the thought I want to leave you with. If that doesn't happen, efforts to support the Palestinians, as well as Palestinian efforts in themselves, will continue to be fragmented. And that's one of the weaknesses that we've had all along. My idea, which is the Equal Rights Campaign, would have the people in, on the ground leading it, and the diaspora and their friends supporting it. So you don't have 101 projects talking about different things, the diaspora's role is like the anti-apartheid uh, role. You support the demand for equal rights inside. If you don't do that, you will continue to have a fragmentation of effort and suffering and bloodshed. And we don't want that. start with three questions. I'll call, if you've got a question, put your hand up. And yes. Yes, I think all three speakers agree on at least two things. One, the necessity of decolonizing the Zionist settler colonial state and the necessity to undermine the Western support for that colonization process, which is accelerating all the time. You have different political concepts and ideas for, for what to call a political agenda, you know, such as a one democratic state or equal rights and so on. But I want to ask two questions about those points where you agree. One, what are the different roles and responsibilities of people there and here? 
because at least two of you spoke in great detail about the difficulties of trying to gain support for a decolonization project there. And, and it's important that we realize that, we understand that, but people here can't directly do anything about that. What we can do is, and are trying to do, we have been trying for decades, some of us, to undermine Western government support for the colonization project. So, so the second question then, about our role and responsibility, how can this perspective on decolonizing uh, Israel-Palestine help us to be more effective in undermining that Western government support? And in particular, and let's, let's be cl clear, I agree with everything you said about the so-called two-state solution, which really should be called a narrative, because it, it never was a solution, but it's a crucial narrative because it helps to justify that Western collusion. It's not the explanation for the collusion. It's, it's pointless. Well, it's not pointless, but it's, it might be futile simply to argue that it's a delusion and it never was a solution because that doesn't explain the Western support. It's merely a pretext. So how do we undermine the pretext and the political drivers for Western support for the colonization project? There seems to be a tension in... Um, I guess, the narrative or logic of this one-state solution to me. And that's in that um, when you look at other settler colonial contexts in the present day, so-called Australia, so-called Canada, etc., um, they also work with this premise, uh, like I think Haim mentioned, that it's an indigenous peoples in a decolonizing movement who possess the final say, the veto power, the authorizing power for settlers' continuity in a decolonized future. I'm interested to know how you think that premise um, of, I guess, indigenous sovereignty being the primary or most important thing that's valued in a decolonizing process can then be reconciled with this, I guess, multifaceted or split or conglomerate kind of sovereignty that you're imagining. Um, how can it be that indigenous people on one hand should have that final say or that first say even, and on the other hand, are uh, expected to share those, that authority in a one-state solution. I am a little surprised to have had no reference at all tonight to the Holocaust, because I've heard a huge number of generalizations. I will only look in detail at peace initiatives and I spent a considerable amount of time at a school, which I'm sure you will know, called the Hand in Hand School in East Jerusalem. Uh, there are now several of these schools um, across uh, Israel. Um, and what is impressive is that they are set up precisely to bring together young Jews right, from the earliest age um, and young Muslims, they have an equal... Yes, quickly come to your They have an equal... Well, I am just wondering wh wh why it is that we are not supporting those kinds of initiatives, which are very successful, rather than talking in this very general way, which we may indeed ultimately need to do um, today, and to highlight the fact that there are really successful initiatives. So there are those two things... One, that okay, I believe then, that yeah, we need to talk about shared suffering, and two, that we need to support these very practical enterprises. Okay, there's four questions that have been thrown out. I think one of the things we've been thinking about is this issue of strategy. There's no one-to-one -one correlation with South Africa, but South Africa provides some very useful lessons for us or possibilities. And in some ways in South Africa, you had the same situation. You know, you had a white uh, dominant uh, ruling population that was never going to consider ending apartheid or giving equal rights to anybody else. Uh, and of course, a hostile government, the, the apartheid government, and an international community, by which I mean governments that were also hostile to the ANC and to the anti-apartheid people, Britain, as usual, in the lead. And... Uh, so I think the ANC strategy, and this was the strategy used by the FLN as well in Algeria, and that was to bypass 
all those obstacles, instead of saying, well, you know, they're so powerful, they're so strong, they have so many weapons, they're so supported by the international community, what can we do? And they took that as a challenge. And what they did, is we, as some of us of a certain age <laughs> all know, was they went directly to the international grassroots, the ANC and the FLN. And they went to uh, churches that were very important. They went to university groups, they went to human rights groups, they went to, uh, community, you know, they mobilized. They mobilized the international grassroots. But they mobilized them, and that's what we're missing today. They mobilized them around a political program. In South Africa, the political program was, in modern terms, one person, one vote. That was the political program. So everybody knew why they were BDSing South Africa and, uh, and what the political program was. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, we were able to mobilize. That played, a, a, I think, a cer a, certainly an important role in collapsing South Africa. I think that's what Palestinians and their anti-colonial Israeli allies have to do as well. And we're never going to convince the Israeli population that, you know, they're e that they're even colonists or that, uh, you know, uh, they should give equal rights to Palestinians or that, uh, you know, it should be two... I mean, we're never going to do that. I mean, I mean, why would they? The central colonial project is succeeding. <laughs> they're, they're ruling the country. They're benefiting. They have international... Why would they? So I think what we have to do is replicate what the ANC did to a degree. And that is create what I call a tripartite alliance. That is, the struggle has to be led by Palestinians. And that's a huge problem we don't have to get into tonight. You know, the fact that, that there is no more PLO uh, has left a tremendous hole uh, politically and, and also organizationally in, the pal in, the, in this scattered Palestinian uh, people. So the, you know, the Palestinians struggle to, to organize themselves and to mobilize around their, a political program of their own uh, and to define their own liberation is, is huge. But leaving that aside then, a Palestinian-led struggle with a very clear political program. Because without the political program, you've, you've got nothing to mobilize around. And anti-colonial Israelis like us come into the, into the story, you know, the, uh, the white members of the ANC played an important role in that struggle. But the main, the main thing, and this is what I want to get to, is that then the Palestinians mobilize you guys. I mean, you're the only ally that the Palestinians have, really. And, uh, and I think you're more powerful than, uh, than you realize. And we, we showed that in the anti-apartheid movement and, and at other times in history. And I think... Uh, Israel's not as strong as the Palestinians think it is. I think they have more leverage than they know. Because uh, Israel is strong among governments. But it's not strong, I think it's lost to a large degree in the court of public opinion. Not everybody is active, of course, on the Palestine issue. Partly because there is no political program, so a lot of people might be sympathetic, but they don't know what to be active about. But uh, I think the Palestinians can mobilize no less than the ANC did, the international, the international public. And then, and then your role on the one, in one direction is to change your government's policies. And that the FLN and ANC did manage to do. And also to effectively boycott economically and in other ways, it was a sports boycott, uh, Israel. Um, uh, you know, and make it just impossible for corporations to, uh, to be associated with. So I think that's that's the strategy that we have to follow. So that right now you you, you just keep doing what you're doing because we're not there yet. But when there becomes a point where there is a consolidation around a political program that a critical mass of Palestinians accept, then I think the time will come when you will be mobilized. And 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 I think that's the way forward. And and just really quick, uh, in terms of your question. Um, you know, it's a, it's a real issue of racism <coughs> versus sharing the state, especially with the population. Many of you know, the students here, all know Mahmoud Mandani, who's a very important uh, scholar of center colonialism. Uh, he himself was uh, an Asian who was expelled from Uganda during Idi Amin's time. He went to Columbia University in the States, and he's back now in Uganda as a chancellor of Kampala University. And he has a very interesting new book, actually, called Neither Settler Nor Native, in which he talks about the Palestinians 
South Africa, and the Native Americans. And he has a very interesting point. And that is, that is that, you know, when he was a young man, and, uh, and part of the anti-colonial movement fighting, fighting the, uh, the colonists of Ghana for, for, for independence, um, you know, and, and they won, and they won their political independence, he said they were, they were euphoric. They thought that they were going to go back now to the pre-colonial time. The colonists are gone. You know, it's our country again. We've taken it back again. They're in a, even in a better position than the Palestinians. It wasn't the colonial population that remained behind. It's our country again. And then he discovered what he called, they discovered what he calls uh, colonial legacies. Colonial legacies. The country is not the same country as it was before colonialism, even without the colonists. The economy is different. The geography is different. The urbanization is different. I mean, everything is different in, in that country. And I think that's what we have, what the Palestinians are going to have, to, I, I think they understand that, but they haven't completely internalized it in terms of a political program. And that is, yes, we want our liberation. And, uh, and, and, and like I said, have an intra-Palestinian discussion about what that means and so on. And, uh, but at the same time, I, and, and, and almost all Palestinians, except maybe those in some of the refugee camps that, that don't have any contact with the country, realize that they're not going to go back to 1941. That there is a colonial legacy here that, that, is, that is permanent even after colonialism ends. And that, I think, has to be just taken, you know, it's a, it's a bitter uh, 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 pill to, to swallow and so on. But that's a part of the equation. And I think it's up to the Palestinians, actually, to, they're going to have to go through that process of reconciliation. So it's, it's, uh, it's there, it's a contradiction, it's true, but it's a legacy of the colonial period that, that is simply a reality. Thank you, Jeff. Got it. Would you like to address the fourth it was yeah. actually the fourth question, yeah. or any of the others. I know. This is yeah. your opportunity. Yeah. yeah, just a few words about the, the first question, which was about decolonization and what's <clears throat> the role of people who are outside Palestine, supporters, what's the role in that? You see, I one of the reasons that I'm, I'm putting forward this demand for equal rights, so the campaign for equal rights, is that it, it will decolonize Israel. It just goes straight to the heart of the thing. Supposing, let's imagine that they get equal rights, the Palestinians get equal rights. What do you think the result will be? There's already more of them than there are Jewish Israelis. The result will be no Zionism, because Zionism can, by definition, requires a Jewish majority. That will put the end, an end to that. And the, the, the whole paraphernalia around Zionism will also crumble once you get right into the heart of it. And in terms of supporters, it's a support for something very simple, very easy to understand, a demand for equal rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Jeff puts it as one, one person, one vote. Uh, really, it, whatever is devised as the slogan, the Palestinians have to do it. There's no question about it. They have to do it. They have to start it, they have to put forward that program with demands of rights. And then the role of people outside is to support the equal rights. Very quickly on the question of a Holocaust, why would I, why would there be a reference to the Holocaust? I don't understand, I'm not asking you to answer that question. Why would there be? It's a rhetorical question. Why would there be? No, no, hang on, no, you said a lot. Why, why would I? We're talking about Palestinians and we're talking about a movement of settler colonialism. The Holocaust is not something that involves the Palestinians. The Palestinians are not involved in the Holocaust. In active, no, sorry. The Palestinians are not involved in any way, shape, or form with the, with the Holocaust. You are not in Israel. Let her speak. They're not involved in it. And the fact that you've really touched a raw nerve, and the fact that the Palestinians have been made to pay for the Holocaust is disgusting. I'll start from the end. Um, why not the Holocaust? Indeed, 
I actually understand what you're trying to do. I think we all do. And um, please, basically, please. my whole family was destroyed in the Holocaust. I've written about it. I've talked about it. I taught about it. I published about it. This is not the time to speak about the Holocaust. We start to speak about the Nakba. This is time to talk about how we resolve what we as Jews have done after cer certain terrible things have been done to us. Exactly. So the Holocaust should be mentioned because we've done something terrible to the Palestinians. Only in that connection. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, you asked your question, you are not in Israel. Now, uh, basically, Arzmi Bishara, the uh, famous Palestinian intellectual, said uh, and wrote, why Palestinians should understand the Holocaust. Palestinians, not people um, uh, we're talking about here. Uh, because in order to understand the Israeli mindset and the um, great um, madness uh, which is uh, inbuilt into Israeli politics, you need to understand that the Israelis are thinking in terms of the Holocaust about everything. Um, Arafat was Hitler. You remember this. Some of us, in, in my, at my age at least, remember Begin talking about Arafat in his bunker, like Hitler in his bunker. Uh, so basically the Israelis are not normal people in that sense, because they have um, relate to um, a very traumatic time in Europe. But the Palestinians have nothing to do with that. And every time we talk about the Nakba, somebody pulls out the winning card of the Holocaust. And what about the Holocaust? What about anti-Semitism? What are these things to do with Palestine? The Palestinians okay, started so anti-Semitism? Thank you. Who came and, and Shut up! up. Now, I, I, you are unable to listen. We have listened to you. You are unable to listen to us when we answer your question. You're not so, Israel. shut up. You can't get away with it here. Now, the question you asked there, um, the lady on the left, I think is the key question for me tonight. We are not talking immediately. We're talking about a process. Rada has explained it beautifully. Nothing will happen overnight. It can't. The depth of deprivation of the Israeli regime is such that um, enormous damage has been caused to millions of people living under its control and continue to live under its control. Um, they are traumatized, uh, and Israel is not just killing Palestinians, bombing them, um, removing them from their livelihood and their land, but they are traumatizing them by design. Now, I don't want here to start making, um, you know, comparisons to the Holocaust or to any other um, area uh, on, 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 on Earth or any other period on Earth. It is enough to say that the uh, trauma that the Palestinians have suffered is such that it's very difficult to find uh, what to compare it with over the last 70 years. After all, this is a very long trauma. Now, your question relates to the fact that we can't have a system which is uh, symmetrical. And I think the three of us talked about that. There is no point pretending that after a certain date, everything will be fine because we are all living together uh, in peace. There will be enormous problems. Look, there are almost a, t a million children or more than a million children in Gaza. Um, you talked about uh, those schools that take um, Israeli and Palestinian students. I supported those schools. I worked in them. You wrote about them. I worked in them. We three have worked in Palestine in different organizations, so we don't need to be lectured to about what needs to be done. Thank you very much. 
these schools are necessary but will not resolve the problem. The problem can only be resolved by a very strong state. Now, I am normally not a supporter of strong states. But imagine if the state is not strong enough to turn the clock back on racism, to turn the clock back on apartheid, to not allow, to not allow, to actually limit the freedom to speak any hate speech, to limit the freedom. I'm saying this, uh, and this is the case in South Africa, and it would have to be the case in Palestine. So we're not talking about, um, on the one hand, on the other hand, what do you think? It, you know, uh, we want to talk about a Holocaust. Let's invite a survivor and a Nazi, and everyone will explain their point of view. This is nonsensical. We're not going to do that. So, you are unable to uh, let people speak. Uh, the Israelis are very good at that. They don't allow Palestinians to speak. They silence them, and you've learned your lessons very well, and I think you should be um, proud of that. So to end um, my answer to your question, which I think is really very difficult to resolve, uh, what we need to do is, I, I, I'm trying to speak while people are not allowing me to speak. I, I don't understand why. I asked for questions. I asked for questions. I would like to bring, well, we have to bring this meeting to a close and something more positive. We've heard this evening about atrocities that have gone on for far too long. You know, we can hardly bear to, to hear the news anymore about the, the demolition of homes, the, the people dying, the closures, all of this is going on. We want to move on to a just and sustainable solution. This evening, you've heard about ideas that have been developed now, you know, going back to the start of the, uh, what the PLO proposed and with the reviving now of looking at what would be involved in creating one democratic state. We've heard about how this is being unpacked. Questions are being asked, really examined. This is what's going on. There's so much to address. I also started by saying, we're not gonna be able to cover it all tonight by any means, but things have been thrown out. We ask that you go to the resource table outside, see material, from the um, Jewish Network for Palestine, from ICAD UK. We do have a brochure that addresses resisting apartheid, building a shared democracy. We encourage you to engage, engage with governments, engage in solidarity. Let's keep, keep doing what we can because if we want to change history, it does depend on us. It depends on you and me really uh, taking an active role now. So I would like to thank you for coming. I want to thank our speakers for everything that they put us for the years, for the years that they have spent working, researching, writing to, again, lead us forward in new ways to live. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.